Hey, good afternoon. Uh, let me introduce you, Dr. Miguel Angel Jimenez Clavero from Inia Cisa in Valdeolmos. Uh, he's one of the main experts on arbovirus in Spain, in particular with important contributions on waste and virus epidemiology. And for the ones that um, don't know it, let me also recommend you to visit his science blog website on emerging viruses, where he's posting divulgative articles which I think are very important to bring science closer to the non-scientific community. So his talk is entitled Viral Zoonosis and the Reservoir Host, the Animal Component of the One Health Approach. And whenever you want, you can start, Miguel Angel. Uh, thank you very much. Sorry for all this uh, uh, delay. Uh, first of all, thank you for the invitation to this uh, meeting. I'm very pleased and honored to be here and talk about uh, my speciality, which is viral zoonosis. And I will focus, as you told me before, uh, I will focus on the animal component of the zoonotic issue, the, the reservoir hosts and uh, with reference to the One Health approach. Uh, I will first introduce the subject of emerging diseases and zoonosis and One Health by reminding you some figures that uh, are in these infographics uh, of the OIE, uh, in which they remind us that 60% uh, of existing human infectious diseases are zoonotic, means uh, they are shared by humans and animals, and 75% uh, at least of emerging infectious diseases of humans uh, have an animal origin too. For instance, uh, uh, as an average, five new human cases, uh, human diseases appear every year, and of them, three are of animal origin or most agents with potential bioterrorist use are zoonotic pathogens. This underlines the importance of the animal component of One Health. And what is uh, more important also is that 70% of newly discovered pathogens are viruses. Why viruses? Well, probably has to do with the plasticity of the genomes of viruses that are changing pathogens uh, that uh, have an extremely high potential to adapt to different environments. And uh, we can consider as an environment of a virus, its host, they can change and adapt to different hosts uh, with uh, well, high success. And this is the landmark of the emerging disease to change uh, from one host to another and jump uh, and cross the, the species barrier. So viruses are more, very often uh, the agents involved in emerging diseases. And uh, One Health, just a reminder that One Health uh, is the correct approach for emerging diseases and zoonosis because it's uh, a holistic uh, approach in which uh, different aspects of uh, human medicine, veterinary medicine and environmental sciences collaborate in order to give a better uh, understanding of these diseases. So the zoonosis and emerging diseases in general have uh, different components not only um, factors related to the microbes, human and animals, but also genetic and biological factors, ecological factors, physical and environmental factors, social and political and economic factors. All these factors contribute and need the views of uh, specialists in this type of fields in order to give a better picture of the, of the disease. So that's why it's so important, the multidisciplinary uh, approaches such as the One Health approach. Well, let's go a little bit more in depth in the subject of this talk, which is uh, well, uh, zoonotic viruses. This is a, a PROMED uh, infographics in which uh, you can see the world map with different names of emerging incidences 
you can see that the dominant incidence in this uh, year obviously is COVID-19, but there are other different uh, infectious agents, infectious agents that are uh, emerging in different parts of the world. And I will uh, call your attention about this agent, West Nile virus. This is the virus in which I'm well, a specialist uh, in uh, because I've been working since some uh, a long time in this in this virus, and I will take it as an example of how one health uh, approach uh, is important, and the animal component is uh, important to understand the the the, the well the, the disease that it causes and the emergence uh, and how to prevent the emergence of these diseases. Well, in the last 20 years, uh, West Nile virus has become the most widespread arbovirus in the world. You can see this uh, represented in, in a world map in which uh, the reddish areas are areas in which uh, there were human cases described and blue is a non-human but uh, animal or vector identifications of, uh, of uh, virus activity, etc. You can see also the limits of the vectors in, in, in black lines and extreme climate regions in which uh, probably there is no activity or little activity of the, of the, of the disease. Um, also, remind, this map reminds you that there are several genetic lineages of this uh, infectious agent, West Nile virus, at least five different, more, probably more. But the main uh, lineages that cause uh, the most uh, uh, higher number of, of, uh, of uh, outbreaks are lineage one and lineage two. Lineage one uh, grow, um, acquire a big importance when crossed the Atlantic and reached the Americas coast, reached uh, New York, where it caused uh, an important outbreak and then spread throughout all the Americas. This was one of the episodes of uh, emerging infectious diseases more important in the last decades. Uh, in parallel, in Europe and in the Mediterranean, there was a similar observation of the spread of this disease in, in these areas. So mm, from this time to now, the incidence of this pathogen has been increasing and increasing. This also translates into the interest in which researchers consider this disease since 1999. You can see it in the publication, number of publications in PubMed since this year multiplied by several orders of magnitude. So, um, well, this is one of the most important emerging infectious agents in the last uh, years. And the rest of the talk uh, is going to be dedicated to explain the role of the animals in this disease and how we can benefit uh, from the study of uh, the animal component in this uh, zoonotic viral disease. Uh, of, of course, it impacts on human health very much, uh, but you can see in the left-hand side of this slide that uh, most of the infections course asymptomatically in humans from approximately 75 to 80% uh, are asymptomatic. A number of, uh, of, uh, of uh, infections uh, develop mild symptoms like fever, 20 to 25%, and a small number of infections develop more severe disease such as meningitis and encephalitis because the virus is uh, neuroinvasive, is uh, neurotropic and can affect uh, the nervous system. And some, every, every one in every 10 of these severe this neuroinvasive disease can end in death, in death. There is no vaccine available for humans, although there are vaccines available and effective for preventing the disease in horses. Horse is one of the vertebrates, the, the mammal, 
uh, vertebrates that are more affected by this disease. 90% of the cases, again, are asymptomatic, but uh, around 10% show um, a severe disease with ataxia, paralysis, etc. Neurological signs and the mortality in these severe um, cases is high also. For uh, the disease also affect birds, not only affect birds, but uh, birds, wild birds are the reservoir host of this disease. We can, we can say uh, that uh, West Nile virus is a bird virus. Hmm? And some birds uh, cause with no symptoms and some birds can die from the disease. And it depends on many, many circumstances, but the species of bird is important. And raptors, for instance, uh, corvids, passerine uh, birds are more susceptible to the disease than other species of, of, of birds. Uh, was the transmission cycle establishes between wild birds and mosquitoes, mainly Culex mosquitoes. Uh, for a bird to transmit the virus to a mosquito, the virus must reach viremias above 10 to the 4 plateforming units per milliliter. So if the host reaches this viremia, a mosquito that bites this host can acquire enough uh, virus in order to get infection and then transmit infection. We can see a little bit more in detail how does it happen. In the avian host, the virus multiplies and reach some um, amounts of virus in the blood, the viremia, so-called viremia. Different types of, uh, of, of host, of bird host, uh, reach different uh, viremias. You can see it in the plot in which, for instance, passeriforms have a higher and longer viremias than, for instance, galliforms in the, in the bottom of the list. So um, passeriforms are better, uh, better host, better reservoirs of the disease than uh, galliforms, for instance, chickens. Uh, in the other side, uh, mosquito vectors also show some barriers, some, some requirements to be good vectors. So the, 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 the virus must be acquired through mosquito bite in enough amounts to infect the middle, the mid gut and cross the mid gut infection barrier to disseminate through the body of the mosquito and then reach the salivary gland where it has to infect the cells of the salivary glands in enough amounts to get uh, to reach uh, enough levels to uh, be transmitted by the next uh, bit of the mosquito. Uh, in this way, the, the mosquito transmits the virus to another avian host. Um, I forgot to tell you that uh, for the virus to reach humans or horses, uh, the mosquitoes need, uh, that are infected from the rural cycle must to, to, to reach uh, humans or horses and uh, transmit the virus. This is uh, a phenomenon that uh, is outside the rural cycle and normally uh, involves a spillover event, which means that uh, there are under certain circumstances, uh, the virus can reach other populations and infect them. But uh, these accidental hosts or dead end hosts such as horses and humans don't transmit the virus again to mosquitoes. So they are dead end and they don't transmit. Um, in this plot, you can see how uh, the cost of the control of outbreaks in this disease, as in many others, depends on how late you react to control the disease. And if you have early warning systems 
to tell you that the virus is there and you have to take measures to control before, you can save a lot of money and a lot, a lot of lives. This is the main message of this, of this plot. Early warning can be established in the animal side of the One Health approach, yeah? in the animal component. Either in vectors, if the disease is transmitted by vectors, or in, in the animals, if it's a zoonosis without vectors. But uh, you can see that if you establish a good monitoring of the virus presence in these host or vectors, you can save uh, time and costs in the control. And this is not an OIE or, 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 or WHO plot, it's a World Bank plot. So means the economic, uh, economic interest is also important here. The main message is that the virus need to be catched before it catches us. A reminder that uh, in our area, in the Mediterranean and European territories, uh, there are other pornitic mosquito-borne fly viruses that are circulating together with West Nile virus and sharing with West Nile virus the same cycle, the same or similar vectors and similar birds as reservoir hosts. So they can interfere in surveillance of West Nile virus. That's why I uh, wish to remind you that they see the existence of these fly viruses. The rest of the talk will be dedicated to summarize some examples that obtained from our laboratory uh, in which uh, the hosts can help to understand and to react, to better react to, to West Nile virus outbreaks. Um, we have been working hard with different in vivo experiments, lots of different in vivo experiments with uh, up to seven different uh, bird species represented here in this slide. Out of these seven species, we obtained, uh, well, uh, re more relevant results for this talk in three of them. The, the rest of them, were infected but didn't show severe symptoms, etc. So they were less important for that. So uh, we will center on uh, the house sparrow, the red ledge partridge, and the gray partridge because they, these three species of birds, are highly susceptible to the disease but also can behave as reservoirs of the virus. So. What can we obtain from these studies? We can see, we can guess about the host range of the, of the virus, the reservoirs of the virus, the pathogenicity of the different strains of the virus, the transmission competence for a given species to different strains of the virus, the spread capacity, persistence, overwintering, and also importantly, non-vector bone transmission. Let's check a little bit uh, about all these with examples from our own lab and our own experience. This uh, slide summarizes one typical uh, in vivo experiment uh, infecting red ledge partridge with different strains of West Nile virus. You can see different uh, different outcomes such as the viremia levels obtained with three different uh, strains, symptoms like weight gain, different, uh, this is the control group and the different strains, uh, what they, the, 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 the loss, the weight loss or, or less weight, weight gain, neutralizing antibodies in, in different uh, infections, the presence of the virus in oral, cloacal, feathers, uh, 
etc. Also, uh, morbidity and mortality results in diff using different strains. All these uh, data make you more mm, aware of the importance of the, of the bird species you are using and also the importance, relative importance and relative pathogenicity, virulence, etc., of the different strains used in the experiments. Importantly, for, inst for instance, we didn't see any contact transmission in any of these experiments using red ledge partridge with uh, these five different uh, West Nile virus strains. This was uh, not the case with the same uh, experimental setting, but using Bagatha virus instead of West Nile virus. In red ledge partridge, Bagatha virus was able to tr be transmitted by direct contact, contact to all the contacts of, uh, of, uh, of a uh, set of, of uh, infected uh, red ledge partridges. Changing a little bit from of a species, the house sparrow was used also to calculate the competence in this, that is the ability of this species to transmit the virus to mosquitoes, uh, the virus from different origins, from different strains, New York 99, Spain, Italy, etc. Blue and red colors are different experiments. We will, I will call your attention for uh, uh, about the last experiment using New York 99, which is a lineage one West Nile virus, and Austria 2008, which is a lineage two. Hmm? And uh, what can we, what can we conclude from this from this uh, experiment? You can see here the profile, the viremia profiles using lineage one, lineage two uh, strains. Lineage two strain from Austria can be transmitted shorter times than lineage one. Uh, that is more or less one day for lineage two, three days for lineage uh, one. What does it mean? It means more time more opportunities to infect mosquitoes, more transmission, and more distance. So, and directly we can draw conclusions from this experiment on the ability of uh, house sparrow to spread different uh, strains of the virus. Mm -hmm. Another set of experiments was intended to assess whether co-circulating flavivirus can cross-protect from alethal infections of West Nile virus. And well, the, the, the result is that yes, previous experimental infection with Bagatha virus or with Usutu virus protected from alethal infections with West Nile virus. Um, mm, Another, another set of uh, studies is field studies. We have been involved since a long time in different types of studies using uh, serology as a tool for uh, drawing um, better information regarding the territorial expansion and the different affection of different populations of vertebrates in, 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 in some areas affected by West Nile. Uh, brought this uh, study, which is quite recent, but uh, just as an example of uh, what can we are we involved in the in this field. And you can see in Extremadura, which is in Western Spain, the the distribution of uh, horse of seropositive horses is widespread in Extremadura, with up to twenty percent of uh, 
of uh, seroprevalence in these populations of, of, of uh, horses. The same has been already performed in, in, in wild birds in the same areas, so, but it is not yet uh, published. Uh, and we, well, using these approaches, uh, we can have a better uh, picture of what is happening in a given area. And finally, to finish with uh, examples of uh, utilities of uh, the animal uh, component of One Health, you can see the phylogenetic analysis of Spanish and Western Mediterranean strains. Most of them have been obtained in our laboratory, isolated or detected in different uh, animals. So you can see here vultures, horses, partridges, eagles, uh, barn owls, etc. Uh, and uh, these type of studies can tell you the relationships between these strains, but not only the relationship, but the the the, the kind of the origin of the of the of the different strains. And uh, you can see that some branches of this tree are more populated than others. It means that the strains that are involved in these populated branches are more successful at uh, spreading and, uh, and persist in the territory because of the years you can see uh, here, the, the years in which we have been obtaining them. And others like the, those ones of this group uh, were only present in a limited uh, number of years and they extinguish it later. So we can draw from these, uh, from these results the conclusion that some strains are more successful than others at spreading and maintaining the circulation in a given territory. And we wonder why that happens, and we are working to know a little bit better uh, about this phenomenon. Uh, main take home messages uh, to finish with, West Nile virus is an emerging neurovirus with impact on animal and human health. Its transmission cycle is governed by complex interactions between wild birds, vector, and environmental factors that may differ between different transmission settings. The study of the infection in vertebrate host is extremely useful to elucidate essential aspects of West Nile virus, such as transmission, spread, spillover, persistence in the environment, and demonization and pathogenicity. And this virus is a good example that the application of the One Health approach to understand, forecast, prevent, and mitigate outbreaks of zoonotic viruses is the most adequate option. Here, the last, uh, the last uh, slide uh, in which we acknowledge the funding sources in, from Europe, from national funds, etc., and the collaborations from Instituto de Salud Carlos III, the Estación Biológica Doñana, Universidad de Extremadura, etc., and the team at CISAINIA. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you for this nice talk. Uh, I have here a question from Juana Diaz. Uh, do pigeons transmit West Nile virus? Excuse me? Do pigeons transmit West Nile virus? Is Juana Diaz asking you? Well, not really. Uh, we have performed uh, experiments with turtles, which are also col columbiformes uh, species, and they don't transmit the, 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 the uh, well, they don't reach enough paremia to transmit the virus to mosquitoes. So they cannot, the, the, the virus cycle cannot be established between uh, turtles and mosquitoes. This is, this is, I don't know if this, uh, you are uh, asking about, about uh, pigeons. Uh, 
Uh, there are experiments um, in the literature, not from our laboratory, in which uh, rock pigeons were infected with West Nile virus and they didn't uh, reach enough baremia to transmit the virus to mosquitoes. Also, the, we can see, we can tell that uh, there are other non-vector transmission possibilities. One is uh, prey, uh, prey eating. I mean, uh, birds of prey can eat uh, meat infected with West Nile virus, and maybe they can uh, acquire the infection in that way. And this cannot be discarded. Okay. And then I have a question about the vaccine that it's uh, that we use in, in horses. It's how, how effective it is to protecting against different virus strains, and it has been tested for humans and in some the same vaccine if it's effective in, ho in horses. There are several types of vaccines uh, in the market for horses. Um, they have not been uh, applied to humans, as far as I know, although I have heard that, uh, well, some people has <laughs> in, in, in the United States use them for their own, in, in their own risk for protecting themselves. But this is anecdotal, you know. Uh, for horses, as far as I know, they have been some, uh, th there are uh, three types of vaccines. One is, the, the, the oldest one is uh, an in inactivated vaccine based on inactivated virus, which uh, is uh, effective, but needs uh, to be revaccinated uh, every year, I think. There is another one which is uh, based on recombinant pox virus, pox virus, canary pox. And I think this is also uh, uh, effective, uh, completely effective. Uh, and it, both are effective for lineage one and lineage two. These uh, experiments have been performed, uh, I think in the, in the reference, European reference lab for equine diseases in, in ANSES. And, and there is another one that is a DNA vaccine that was in the market, but I don't know if it is still in the market anymore. I don't know. There is an also a, a, another vaccine that, well, well it's, it's a Kimerivax, which is a vaccine that uses 17D strain of yellow fever as a backbone to help uh, other flaviviruses uh, structural proteins. And this is, has been used, this approach for several flaviviral diseases with success, but not for West Nile, although the construct exists, but for some reason, no company has uh, taken the the interest to continue working on that. Okay, thank you. So there are no more questions. Uh, we move on with the next talk, Anna. Thank you. Thank you. We should move to the oral presentations. Is uh, Irene, Irene Ontiveros. Hi. Are you ready? <laughs> okay. Yeah. okay. So our first speaker is Irene Ontiveros uh, from the uh, Center for Research in Agricultural Econ Genomics. And the title of uh, her presentation is The Role of Visual and Olfatory Cues in Host Plant Selection by the Insect Vector Bemisia tabasi in Mixed in Infections of Tomato Chlorosis Virus and Tomato Yellow Leaf Curl uh, Virus. So go ahead, Irene. <laughs> okay, thank you for the presentation. Just let me a minute, please. 
Well, okay. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Now I'm I'm here uh, to talk about viruses as well. But in spite of the excellent sessions we have heard from now, I wanted to focus all the attention on plant uh, plants viral infections, especially in mixed infections with more than one virus and their interaction with other organisms. Well, plants are constantly challenged by diverse kinds of pathogens as uh, plant viruses, which are widespread in both natural and agricultural plant communities. Most of these uh, viruses require a vector to be transmitted from host to host. And the most common ones are uh, the um, flow and feeding insects, as for example, white flies or uh, aphids. Uh, which are able to transmit a great number of these plant viruses. Well, when infecting a host, plant viruses are capable to induce um, several visual and olfactory alterations. Um, and these phenotypic changes can be relevant for the host selection process by insect vectors during the infection with a given virus. However, we wanted to go one step forward and um, we wonder how the alterations induced by the simultaneous presence of several viruses in a susceptible host may influence in the host selection process by insect vectors. Thus, we focused in the study of the uh, network interaction within the pathosystem you can see in this slide. Here, uh, we have two viruses, tomato chlorosis virus and tomato yellow leaf curl virus. And um, these two viruses uh, primarily affect tomato plants and both are transmitted by the uh, insect vector, the white fly, Vemisia tabaxi. Okay, this knowledge, uh, sorry, this study will expand our knowledge on mixed infections and could help to update the strategies of control of viral diseases in crops. On one hand, we have the tomato chlorosis virus, uh, which is one of the species belonging to the genus Crinivirus in the family Clostroviridae, and is considered as an emergent plant pathogen responsible of the tomato chlorosis disease. This virus may cause several um, symptoms in tomato plants as the irregular chlorotic molting on the intervenial yellowing chlorotic areas, as you can see in this picture. The, um, the genome of this virus is um, composed of, of two single strain positive sense RNA molecules, RNA1 and RNA2, and is transmitted by several, several white fly species uh, as, for example, the uh, uh, Bemisia tabaki, in a semi-persistent manner, which means that the acquisition and the inoculation of the virus required short uh, periods of time. On the other hand, tomato yellow leaf curl virus uh, uh, belongs to the genus Becomovirus in the family Geminibiridae, and is currently reported as one of the most widespread viruses um, uh, sorry, causing the tomato yellow leaf curl disease. The characteristic symptoms of this disease in uh, tomato plants include the upward curling of leaflet margins, yellowing of young leaves, stunting, and the reduction of the leaflet area. It has a single strand uh, circular DNA genome and is transmitted by the white fly Vemisia tabaci in a persistent circulative manner, which means that the white fly need more time to acquire and inoculate the virus, and this virus can also be replicated inside of the, of the insect. Well, among all the experiments um, we developed here, we compared both single and mixed infections with uh, TOC and TYLCB by using healthy plants as control. Here in this slide, you can see the comparisons of the phenotypic changes induced in this um, in each single or double infections when comparing with the, the healthy plants, the, the control. Well, symptoms observed in all the plants we tested were ranged from moderate, um, which uh, corresponds to the values one and two in this zero to five scale, to severe that corresponding with the values four and five. In plants infected only with TOC or only with TYLCB, 
we observe typical symptoms induced by uh, each of these viruses, showing how higher um, severity of the symptoms in those plants infected with TYLCV when comparing with the plants infected with DOC. However, in case of mixed infections, we show different outcomes among time, suggesting that um, an initial antagonistic interaction occurs at the early stages of the infection, showing similar symptoms than those observed in single infection with TOC, that towards to a synergistic interaction with an ex exacerbation of TYLCV symptoms. We also estimated the relative abundance of both viruses, and we noticed that this dynamic response of symptoms seemed to be correlated with the dynamic of TOC accumulation, as the relative abundance of this virus uh, significantly increased in mixed infected plants at 21 days post inoculation, just at the same point as um, we noticed the uh, higher severity of the symptoms that suggests the synergistic interaction between both viruses. Well, considering that uh, this dynamic situation may compromise the effectiveness of control measures against viruses, we consider that understanding the influence of visual and olfactory cues emitted by these mixed infected plants in the host plant selection uh, by their common vector, Vinicia tabaci, could have practical implications for the management of viral diseases. Hence, uh, we designed two choice experiments under control conditions. First, we developed a, uh, sorry, the um, dual choice experiments to test the first choice of the white fly when exposed to both uh, visual and olfactory stimuli. And then, we tested the role of the volatiles emitted um, by the plants in the uh, white fly host, host selection by using a white tube olfactometer. Well, in these dual choice experiments, we performed a pairwise comparisons of tomato leaflets, a, a single and double infected with a, both viruses, a, using healthy leaflets a, as control. Here we um, disposed all the, the leaflets we wanted to compare inside a plastic cage, a key distance to a um, flight release platform which was, which was disposed in the middle of this cage. And we tested a, a total number of 60 uh, non viruliferous and 60 viruliferous white flies. Each of them were uh, disposed in this um, uh, platform, and we recorded only their first choice. In this slide, you can see the results we obtained of these experiments, and here we can observe that not only um, viruliferous and non-viruliferous white flies prefer to land on TYLCV or mixed infected plants than on healthy or talk infected ones, but also no significant, sorry, but also not significant um, differences in host selection between double and single infections uh, with TYLCV were found for neither uh, white fly. Well, these results suggest that the presence of TYLCV may condition the host plant preference, preference response of this white fly, Benicia tabaci. Considering these results, we evaluated whether uh, volatiles emitted by TYLCV infected plants contributing or not in um, the white fly preference uh, behavior by using a white tube olfactometer. With this instrument, the white fly, which is disposed in the um, interception of this uh, white tube, is able to make a choice based on the reception of the volatiles emitted by the plant by moving through one of these arms. Well, a total number of 60 non viruliferous and 60 viruliferous white flies were tested, and uh, the non significant uh, preferences found show a neutral effect of these olfactory stimuli. 
in the choice behavior of the white fly, which supported the idea that um, the visual stimuli associated with the expression of symptoms of TYLCV seem to be more important in preference responses by enhancing the attractiveness of the white fly. Well, to conclude, we can draw the following conclusions of this work. Uh, one, the, the mixed infected plants with TOG and TYLCB progress from early antagonism to late synergism, a change that correlates with TOG accumulation. Two, the white fly vector seem to respond to visual stimuli mainly conditioned by the presence of TYLCB in both mixed uh, or single infected plants. And three, that the knowledge of this dynamic situation could have practical implications for the management of viral diseases in complex ecological environments. Well, I want to thank my directors and all the, um, the research team I work with in both of the, of the institutes. Thank you. Thank you, Irene. Many thanks for the presentation. I don't see questions here. Let's see. Uh, well, I wanted to ask you, is, is it possible also that uh, these infections uh, could attract uh, new vectors? Uh, do you mean the, the symptoms or? Yes, yes. Well, yeah, probably the, the symptoms because uh, most of the, of the insects are attacked of um, this kind of symptoms like yellow colors or so, but not all the insects can be vector for all the viruses. Okay. Okay. And for this uh, switch in the dynamics, are there specific genes that are uh, from the uh, second virus that are uh, expressed at these 14 hours post-infection? So the, the switch is justified by the uh, these viral genes, or, or there are well, several uh, genes? <laughs> uh, well, actually, we're currently working on, on this. Uh, so I hope that um, I will have a result soon, and I will I will, it will be a pleasure to answer your question, but right now I want, I just uh, can say that I'm working on this, exactly on this. Very good, thank you. <laughs> thank you, so th I think we move to the next talk. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Okay, next talk is from Eric. Yeah. <laughs> you are there? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Okay, hi Eric. Uh, so next talk is uh, Eric Rosmoner. Uh, from the Center for Research in Agricultural um, Genomics. Uh, and he's going to talk about uh, the identification of a gene product with RNA, the RNA silencing suppression uh, activity in the symptomless potivirus uh, sweet potato latent virus. So you can go ahead. <laughs> okay, <laughs> thank you. So good afternoon. Wait. Yeah. Good afternoon, I'm Eric Ross and I have collaborated with the Plant Viruses Group at CRAC. And our work deal with sweet potato, that is a main crop in tropical region. It could be infected by different pathogens, including at least five potiviruses. And here we can see the genome structure of these four, one, at least four phytoviruses. And it's a polyprotein that autocatalytically proceeds into functional mature proteins and at least with also two more gene products produced by the RNA slippage mechanism, polymerase slippage mechanism, as Janina have presented before. But in our case, we work with sweet potato latent virus. And, and you can see here in its genome structure, it lacks the P1 and PISPO. And our group have worked and demonstrated that P1 and PISPO can act as a, a strong RNA silencing suppressor. So in other potoviruses. So our objective was to identify what is the gene product acting as a RNA silence suppressor in sweet potato latent virus. So um, we perform a translate expression of viral, prote uh, viral proteins in nicotinamentamine and leaf using agrobacterium tumefaciens. 
and we clone different protein as P1 H Pro and P1 H Pro using a strong promoter. And we also clone GFP that will be our border gene under UV light. So here we see the structure, the figure of the leaf. In one side, we have the positive control that it will be GFP plus an RNA silencing suppressor known. And here we will see in the negative control, we will be GFP plus an empty vector. And here the X, it will be our third part, and it will be the GFP plus P1, H Pro, or P1 H Pro. So the results show that P1 in EP1 we cannot detect any any activity. And comparing with H Pro, we can determine that it will be a strong RNA uh, RNA silencing suppressor. Here we can see the activity comparing with the positive control. And consequently, we perform an coagulation infiltration of P1 H Pro either in three screen trans, and we see a strong activity too. So we will say that uh, H Pro will act as an RNA, a strong RNA silencing suppressor, and that P1 has a non-modulation effect um, in H Pro. So to conclude, I will say that H Pro of Latent Latin virus attack a strong RNA silencing suppressor, that P1 of Latent Latin virus do not exhibit any detectable activity, and there is no modulation effects where we're observing the activity of H Pro with the presence of P1. And I want to remark that further, further further work will be needed in order to characterize the mode of action of Swipodato Latin virus XG Pro and to see its viral infectivity, pathogenicity, symptoms, detection, etc. And that's all for me. Thank you for your attention. Okay, many thanks, Eric, for this beautiful <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, presentation. So let's see if there are. There are no so far to, uh, questions. Um, I asked you one: is is the is the structure of the SC Pro uh, known? And do you know which are the domains involved in this uh, suppressor activity? Or you can guess them due to the in, other proviruses? In sweet potato Latin virus. Yes. Or in other, yeah, in sweet potato Latin virus, we already don't know. That's why I told that we will need further research on it because we have worked in, in other viruses with H Pro and we know some domains we can predict, but we are already not sure. We are working on it and further so we can know to determine exactly which domain is involved. Okay, okay. There can be more than one of these suppressor genes in a, in a virus, in one of these viruses? Uh, we, we cannot, determinize I, I have not report at least me i have not <laughs> seen more than one rna sensitive suppressor in that viruses okay 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 so there are no further questions so we go to the next talk many thanks okay <laughs> thank you okay now it's turn of edward edward and Fruns estrada from University of Barcelona. Are you there, Eduard? Yes. The, the talk is titled Detection of Norovirus in Saliva Samples from Cases and Asymptomatic Subjects Involved in Gastroenteritis Outbreaks. So, go ahead. So, thanks to Dr. Argelaget for the presentation. Human noroviruses are the leading cause of non bacterial gastroenteritis. These highly infectious viruses are transmitted through fecal oral route, including contact with infected individuals, exposure to contaminated food and water, or vomiting aerosols. At least, there are seven noroviruses genogroups, but only one, two, and four can infect humans, being one and two the most prevalent. An important fact is that not all individuals are equally susceptible to norovirus infection. Cause secretor status, determined by the expression of HBGA, is the blood group antigens, interferes in viral infection. Diarrheal stools are used to detect noroviruses, but recently studies also reported the detection into oral cavity. So the objective of this study 
was to characterize the presence of human noroviruses in saliva in correlation with the virus strength, the occurrence of symptoms, the secretory status, and the virus shedding in stool. In the next um, diapositive, main results of saliva characterization will be discussed. The first one was that after analyzing 385 saliva samples in the group of symptomatic subjects, and 18.37% were positive for norovirus in saliva. In contrast, the asymptomatic subjects only represent 3.23%. In addition, as it's shown in the table, all saliva samples positive belong to the genome group 2 of noroviruses. The second result refers to the correlation between saliva individuals and their symptomatology. As um, can be seen, affected individuals older than 65 years old were indirectly associated with the presence of human noroviruses in saliva. But in any case, the rest of the symptoms, such as secretory status, vomiting, or nausea, doesn't especially, specifically correlate. The third result was that individuals which are positive in saliva show significantly higher levels of norovirus in shedding stool compared to those who are negative. And finally, the last result and the most important is that after um, performing an assay of viability PMA, we confirm that virus with intact capsids in saliva. So this could indicate that they are in capacity of infection. So the main conclusions are that oral to oral noroviruses transmission may occur during symptomatic phase and although to a lesser extent, even in cases of asymptomatic infections. As to samples, remain preferable as specimens for the diagnosis of human norovirus infections. Thanks for your attention. Okay, thank you, Eduard. I don't see any question. Uh, one question uh, I make. Uh, how do you explain this in this this patient that you see in, in saliva? The, this, I guess these are high virus loads. I don't know uh, how, how you explain that. Where, where is the virus replicating? The virus load um, is not um, very high in the the overall of the of the human norovirus uh, saliva um, positive cases, but um, this can be explained because of uh, norovirus um, can um, be attached to HBGA, is the blood group antigens that are molecules that are in the um, um, cavities such as oral cavity and the mucos or um, also interact with the receptor in a cell. So, um, the presence could be explained for this reason that um, they interact with the HBGA present in oral cavity. And then also um, can exist uh, a red flux from the um, stomach during nights, for, for, during, during nights for, for, for example. But um, it's really um, very um, curious. The, um, this um, that human noroviruses can can stay also in saliva, but um, it's also related to other enteric viruses, for example, um, rotaviruses, adenoviruses, etc., that also can be um, detected in oral cavity, as it is um, written in some in some studies. I have another question from, from Juanjo Lopez Moya. Uh, yes. Vomiting and diarrhea might serve for transmission, but saliva seems to be less important. Does it presence confers any advantage to the virus? Um, I don't, 
we don't we don't know exactly because um, virus sharing in store is the um, is the, the sample that is used um, in a diagnosis. So um, we think that we cannot say that um, with positive saliva samples, this can be a, a diagnosis tool, although um, vomiting, nausea um, are present in these in these um, individuals.